Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. Hi, I'm Holly McKenna, um, host of Meeting Meet the Author. Um, I am a freelance writer myself, um, but today I have uh, Gary McCluth here with me, who is an associate professor uh, of communications at uh, St. College of St. Rose, and he has written a number of books, and I would like to have a nice little chat with, uh, with Gary about the books he's written, the book he's just published, and some future projects. Gary, Sounds welcome good. to the show. Thanks. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Yeah, so what, so what other books have you written? What, how would what people, other books? How would people well, you know, know who you are? You know, all, <laughs> all writers have a lot of books they've written, um, mm -hmm. which is different from books you've published. So uh, if you want to know what books I've written, I, you know, I, I've probably written some I can't remember. Uh, if, what I can, the forms I've written in are novel, short story, poetry, um, and screenplay. And I've published a lot of poems, and I've published a lot of short stories. I haven't published any novels. I co-authored a, um, uh, a nonfiction book. It, it was actually a study of men and their relationship to um, abortion uh, in general, and in particular to the uh, woman who they were either married to or uh, in a relationship with. And that was called Men and Abortion. That was published by Prager in the mid-'80s and um, got a lot of play, a lot of newspaper coverage, a lot of reviews, a lot of TV and radio attention. So that was, that was really fun. Um, and just because we published the book didn't mean we made any money. I, thi I think we maybe broke even. You can find the book in the library. They, they never did a paperback um, version, so it's in hardcover. Do people use it as a reference? Is it ever used? It's a really good seen? reference book. I haven't seen anything, and and um, my co-author probably has kept better track of it than I have. But nothing on the subject has really been written in this form before or since. There were a lot of pamphlets, a lot of articles, but nobody did any studies. Mm -hmm. We were in like 18 clinics in 30 states, or 30 clinics in 18 states. I guess I was sorry. So that was a lot of work. Um, I spent three years on that while I was in uh, grad school at uh, SUNY Albany, and, and my co-author, who was a professor at Drexel, spent 10 years. He was a sociologist. Um, so that, was a, that really got me into thinking about writing for a bigger purpose than just entertainment. Um, but I think, I, think I, I still see myself as a poet. I mean, I still tend to look at images. I still play with single words I still like to I still like the format I still love um, you know T.S. Eliot and Robert Frost and Adrian Rich and and I can sort of uh, just sort of go through all the poets I've learned from like Muriel Ruckheiser and um, Denise Levertov and Mark Strand and uh, Anthony Hecht and a whole variety of people um, um, and Langston Hughes, the whole Harlem Renaissance. Just people I've studied and read. I've, so, read, I've read Langston Hughes. Yeah. I read, I read him in high school. Yeah. He gets better. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, the best Ballad poets of get... Ballad a Landlord? Is that yeah. yeah, that's the one. That's the the one best poets get better, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I think, as, they, as, uh, as their poetry stays around and people read it. Mm -hmm. And Whitman, of course, and Emerson, mm -hmm. and, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Classic. And I, I love Hawthorne. Mm -hmm. Good American literature weird stuff yeah. now the short story how did you how did you make the segue from from poetry to short stories it's uh, I think part I, I'm not really sure exactly uh, I, I it, it seemed at the time I mean it's always seemed like sort of a natural progression you start mm -hmm. out with um, phrases and then you you know you write you try to do poems I, I've never written I've never really liked long poems because I think um, uh, long poems were basically uh, killed for me in school. So <laughs> I, was, I, I really liked, I couldn't believe it when I discovered Williams. I was like, wow, how do you write you know, this simple stuff like that? I, I, and I, but I also don't like to see poetry just as a chopped up sentence. I mean, I think you gotta do something. There's gotta be leaps there. The short story, um, I'm not sure how I started writing short stories because I tend to be very um, poor at 
brevity. So I guess maybe that's why. Um, I like to try to do things I'm not good at because um, I've discovered what I'm good at and it's fun to do what I'm good at, but I also like try things that I'm not good at. You know, it's a lot like sports. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like stuff I'm not good at. Like I was never, I could never get golf and tennis under control. <laughs> so what, what have I ended up playing most of my adult life? Golf and tennis. And I mean, I still am, I'm still not very good at either one of them. Um, football and baseball I was really good at. But of course, you've got to have a team to do all that. And you know, as you get older, you're, you find yourself lonely. And, and I think loneliness, however you want to define that, um, made me a writer because suddenly I wasn't alone. And a, a short story is a way to make contact with real people who you're imagining uh, or not. But, but even if they're real people you're writing about, you're still imagining them, uh, reimagining them, trying to get a portrait of them under control, get the sound of their voice, uh, put them into a situation that's working. I, I, I'm a realistic writer. I, I don't, I'm not surreal and I'm not, uh, I'm not into metafiction and, and, and those sorts of things, although I know what they are. Uh, and I've read a lot of it. Had some teachers who were, you know, into it, wrote it, um, and who were really terrific writers. But it just didn't appeal to me. I, I also got into storytelling. My grandmother was a great storyteller. I, I, like I, um, I must be the person in my family who's supposed to like tell the story. So uh, I really rely on a lot of the stories I've already heard or parts of them. I mean, part of the story is about all these stories, which I can't remember most of. Uh, but I remember, I remember the um, uh, the great visions that my grandmother could, you know, impart. Um, you know, buildings burning down and Annie Oakley riding backwards on a on a horse and shooting uh, uh, cans off a fence post. I don't remember if she was telling me a story about Annie Oakley doing it or if she was actually doing it herself. You know. Um, <laughs> I'm, there's a couple of stories that I've worked on and off on for 20, 25 years. One of them's about this cousin Henry that uh, she used to have, who was a bit of a, a gay blade in his day, uh, sharp dresser, he was into music, always seemed to have money, had a new car and everything, and he moved to Florida. He was older than my grandmother. Um, and, and they had this incredible correspondence. The other thing that, that my family was always involved in was writing letters. Not just my mother and father, but my sisters, my, my aunt um, in particular. I have one aunt who wrote, wrote me a lot of letters. Um, um, my grandmother wrote me letters. I mean, I still have some of her letters from camp. Mm. Um, oh, great. When I would be seven or eight and they'd have mail called. Of course, all these kids would run down to get their mail and it'd be from their mother saying, you know, Make sure you brush your teeth and wash your face. And I get these letters, four-page letters from my grandmother about, you know, what was going on across the street. And it was just, I don't know, just being with her was like a story, you know. And she, she was a, a, an outdoor person. She um, had what she called a shanty out, out in the back lot. And Wait, where'd you grow up, Gary? Uh, in a town called Corfu. It's, okay. it's east of Buffalo. Okay. It's, like real, it's country. It's mentioned in the book. Yeah, right. you okay. drive out of town and you're mm -hmm. out of town. You're okay. not, it's not a suburb of anything. And, um, you know, it has a graveyard on the nicest property in, in the area on town, and then it goes down into a swamp, and then there's the school, and, you know, it, everything, there's, one, there's one of each of everything. We, we did have a lot of bars and a lot of garages, but even the throughway sort of knocked them out, I guess. I mean, I, I don't know why there were five bars that were only 700 people, but... <laughs> a lot of drinking going <laughs> yeah, on there. the two bowling alleys. <laughs> and a lot of broken down cars. I mean, it's, it's, everybody made a living fixing something. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and all the farmers fixed stuff. I mean, if you did not have fixed something, you had to live somewhere else because the houses all needed fixing and the cars all needed fixing, the tractors and, you know, everything. So that's sort of where the... You know, uh, it's sort of my background comes from, and my father was the town doctor, um, and he had a big practice. Uh, we tried to figure out after he died how many babies he had delivered, and we had all kinds of numbers. I, I don't know where there's probably the the records would show if we could get our hands on the records, but um, the guests came in at around four thousand, and I I thought it was preposterous that he <laughs> he could have possibly done that, and I, I argued with a couple people. One of them was a doctor himself. 
Uh, and he said, no, he said, it's perfect. Your father was like, you know, everywhere and did everything, and he could have done that while he was doing other things. We had records on it. I got it up to 2,200, I think, that I could prove. And I was playing journalist, so I had to prove it. <laughs> and uh, so my cousin said, what, are you kidding? He said, you know, your father practiced for 50 years, and he delivered so many babies every year, and he wasn't even thinking about it. A lot of them were home deliveries, too. Mm -hmm. So he would deliver a baby and then go someplace and do his house calls and do his other work and then come back and check on the mother and the baby and go deliver another one. I don't know. He finally had to quit doing it because he wasn't getting any sleep at all. <laughs> Not that he needed much, but... Wow. So he, he's, he's talked about in the book. I mean, this he's, yeah, he's a, a main character and, uh, and a main inspiration. Natural causes and other stories. Yeah. So, which was a wonderful, wonderful book. Um, which, which one of the, the stories are your favorite? Um, Oh, I don't know. Which, well, which one did you like writing the most? Was the one that, that really... Well, the, the title story, Natural Causes, was, was a real test. Because um, it's based on a woman who used to work for my father and sort of was a caretaker of our family, in a way. I mean, she did everything. Kept the books, uh, ran the office, the business part of it, did the taxes, uh, took care of my sisters and me. Uh, when my parents weren't there, um, and was just she was a, a widow. She had been widowed early in her life, and so what I did with that story was, um, and what I do with a lot of these stories is I try to write them from the point of view of the person, not my point of view. In other words, the author is is not me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not third person, like mm -hmm. uh, you know, controlling people. It's it's in the first person voice of the character. Uh, so I really had to figure out a lot of things about her, which I knew quite a bit about, but I also had to try to get her voice. Um, and she had been um, widowed before I was even born, so I had to try to imagine what her life was like. And, and the research um, took me to many of the coroner's cases that my father was on and um, that she typed up for him. So I, I, I actually went to the records and got the actual language from the coroner's cases, and then I imagined what she would be thinking and she was typing them. So I sort of came up with this character who typed the coroner's cases and then was actually the sort of in-house authority on my family. I mean, she knew more about my family than I did, I'm sure. I mean, and the whole town and how everything worked and everything. Mm -hmm. And she had another job, too. She had a day job. So she worked for my father at night and on her day off which was Saturday, I think. She worked for the county, so she, must, she had the weekends off. So she worked, she worked for him on Saturday, and, and I think one afternoon a week, which was probably Wednesday. And then um, she lived her whole life like that. And she was a very um, petite woman. She was small. She probably weighed about 102, and mm -hmm. she was about 5'4". She never wore makeup. She wasn't a beauty. She, w she wore her house dresses and... Um, when did she have time to get beautiful anyway? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, no, I, I don't mean, I don't, you know... No, no, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. She just... I mean, there like are, like there are, amazing, there are other women. Person. Yeah, she, and she, she, never, she never expressed a lot of um, remorse about anything, and she also didn't express a lot of love. Uh, she laughed, and she, you knew she cared about you, and she was... She just, she wasn't a big hugger. Mm -hmm. I mean, she wasn't, you know, somebody who was always making a fuss over anything. She, she was very efficient about everything she did. And she cooked that way, too. It was like, if you, if she made a salad, it was, you know, it was a, per, it was sort of the perfect salad. It was like, um, it would be on a plate like this, right? And it, and it would just be in the middle of the plate. Mm -hmm. Nothing would be over, you know, my mother made great salads, but all was enormous. Mm -hmm. You know, you couldn't put them on a plate. They were in bowls. Th this woman, her name was Fern, made, <laughs> made a salad that was right here, and then a sandwich would be on this plate, and the sandwich was always perfect. And she made the best peanut butter cookies you've ever had in your life. I mean, they were just insane. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I would get those for Christmas. And she also made cakes for our birthdays, and, and they would always be these very creative cakes, like uh, the, the shape of a schoolhouse, or a fish, or a football field. When I was on the football team, that the, the cake was a football field with the markers and everything and the goalposts. And she was not a sports fan. I mean, I don't, I don't think she ever, 
I don't know. Maybe she did. Maybe when, she went yeah, to a football game. When did she have time? <laughs> I know. I don't know what she had time. I don't know what she had time. Well, when did I'm going well, to sports events? So. That's the other thing yeah. about the story is that's the question. When did she have time to do this stuff? So, and she was alone all the time. She always lived alone mm. in the house that she and her husband built before he died. Okay. Was that Ray? Is that? No. Who was? Why do I have that name in my head? No, maybe what? Not. Her husband's name. What was her husband in the story? In the story, which was his real name, okay. was Roy. Roy. That's right. I'm sorry, Ray. In the Roy. story, right. I know. I don't think her name is mentioned at all. Oh, no, it wasn't. That's what I'm thinking. Because I have, I have, because she's I have Roy. It. I have Roy written down. But so there's nobody. Okay. Right. Okay. She's not. You're very good at that. I have to say, as a, as a woman, um, that you write from a woman's perspective. I mean, there's a couple of the stories in there that are well, that's, really well done. That they really are in the head of a wo- the yeah. mind of a woman, and yeah, uh, they're, they're very good. They're very good, and I love when men do that because typically men just write we, about men because that's the experience that they know. But I read, I read this really in interesting novel by Robert Olin Butler mm-hmm. called, uh, it was about women, They Whisper, I think was the name of the mm-hmm. novel. And I met him, mm-hmm. I used to work for the Writers Institute and they brought okay. him in okay. and I met him and we had a long conversation yeah. and everything and I thought, God, I read this book, you know, and um, he, he, had the, he had women figured out, I mean, as, as narrators. And I don't think most men do. And I, frankly, I don't think a lot of women have it figured out either. <laughs> and so it's, it was really interesting to try to do that. And that was one of the main things I did with these stories. Like there's three of them that I can think of. One of them's written from um, my sister's. It's my sister's story called okay. The Florida Room. Yep. Mm-hmm. And then there's another one called Where I Am, mm-hmm. which is sort of my mother's point of view, but not, I don't know okay. if my, I, I don't think so. But I, it's, it's a character my mother it's would a, be. It's a wife. It's a wife. Right? I, I'm working on yeah. a story now, which is literally my mother. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm rebuilding um, her early life, which I, I know a lot about in a way because she told me about it. But that means I've already got mm-hmm. her point of view. But I, I have my mother's voice down. I mean, I, my father's voice for me is, is where I'm at. Mm-hmm. My mother's voice is very tricky for me to get. I, I don't get it because I spent a lot of time with my father, and he he always spoke in riddles, and uh, he had all these sayings, and he wouldn't tell you much about what he what he knew about particular people. He was not a gossip. Like he wouldn't come home and say, "Oh, guess what I saw today? You know, or, <laughs> guess what Mrs. So and So was? Uh, you know, she's going to have a baby, and the damn thing is four hundred pounds. You know, he, he wouldn't. He was not a sensationalistic." type guy he was very philosophical very con- anybody could tell him anything and, and and have complete trust that he wouldn't spread it around I mean even stuff he should have spread around he didn't you know it's like you didn't get warnings about certain things you know I remember the first time he introduced me to a paraplegic I was like I, 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 I don't I, I'll never forget it he introduced me to this guy who was in a wheelchair we were in a county home he, he also did the county home my father was somebody else like you couldn't figure out how he did all that he did <laughs> in one day. I was like, I was like what, what is this guy crazy and, and he he was very quick um, but he didn't look quick and, and I noticed this at some point um, when I was writing I, I had to start figuring out well what would what would you say about this character and my father was very fast and 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 you wouldn't notice it unless you were slowing him down. Mm-hmm. And then he would, you'd get the, come on, you know, I've got all day kind of line. Or, you know, get your shoes tight for cripe's sakes. Or, you know, you know there, there's, I remember one time <laughs> there was a train wreck and, and, uh, and he got called, it was like four in the morning and he got me up and he got my mother up. He, got, he thought it was going to be the biggest disaster Genesee County had ever seen. And he turned our house into a first aid station. And my mother was, was a uh, dental hygienist and she was also kind of a first aid nut. I mean, we had kits in the house and, <laughs> you know, she taught us how to do tourniquets and that was, that was amazing. So everybody got ready. You got the beds lined up, got cots out and everything. And, and he says, come on, you know, let's go. And, and I, I couldn't find my shoes or something. I don't remember what it was. And I, I was half asleep. You know, he, he comes in because he could wake up instantly. No, nobody else in the family could. We had could. to go deliver a baby. Yeah. Probably. My mother could wake up instantly, but um, none of us kids could. I mean, we always needed, like, give me an hour. You know, he said, come on. He said, I'm, you're, you're going with me. What, I need somebody to, he didn't know what he needed. He just, I was like uh, 15 and I was able-bodied, and so he was going to have me go out into this mess. So 
he yelled, I remember, I remember this, he yells at me, he says, for God's sakes, if you can't tie your shoes any faster than that, he said, you know, uh, people are going to be dying out on the, you know, on the railroad, and you're up here trying to tie oh, your shoes. Oh, gosh, guilt, guilt. Yeah, so I, <laughs> I probably tied him in knots, and we ran out, and uh, fortunately nobody was killed. There was a, a few people injured, but it was the weirdest sight I've ever seen. This car is all twisted mm -hmm. around. Mm -hmm. and How old are you? At odd, probably 15. Oh, okay. okay. At odd angles and everything. It was dark as hell. You know, it's, a, it's in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. The fire department had gotten out there. That they, you know, the, every railroad has little, you know, those cinder cinder roads along the side, mm -hmm. and they had driven out there. And and of course, my father did leave me. He got in the car and left. So I had to get to the wreck by going through the lots because I, I knew where it was. The wreck was sort of behind our house, but not really. And it was a, probably about a, uh, a mile through the back lots, and it was winter. So the, <laughs> I had to climb a couple of fences. So by the time I got to the train wreck, you know, I'm all wet and everything. And, and, and there's all these spotlights, and I hear the people screaming and all kinds yeah. of weird things. And then I heard, I heard this guy laughing. And I'm like, God, that's Dad. What was he laughing at? And, it, and it's... I came. I got. I got up near the the wreck, and it was just stuff was all over. Rails were twisted like hairpins, and, and it was also scary because it was dark except for where these spotlights were, which makes everything seem darker. And I hear this guy laughing. It's my father. He's up on top of this car, and and the firemen are trying to get him to jump, and they're and they're saying all kinds of things, you know, that I can't repeat here about <laughs> about him being a chicken. And, and uh, he's up there laughing at this guy who's saying all this crazy stuff. And uh, I just thought, this is, you know, this is the biggest disaster in history. And, he, you know, I couldn't tie my shoes. And he's out here laughing. And jumping off trains. Yeah, and jumping <laughs> off trains. I mean, that, that's the kind of stuff that used to happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I try to get some of that sense in the book um, that it's not all tragedy. And I don't know if I, I don't know if in these stories that comes across. And, and the story as I'm working on now, I'm trying to do more of that. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, you know, those are memories that you get while you're writing about something else. It's mm -hmm. like a, um, it's like any conversation that you have. You know, like I, I wouldn't, and if I weren't sitting here with you, I wouldn't have thought of the train wreck. Mm -hmm. Seriously. Yeah, yeah. Now, what have you, you said you talked about just the, the humor in the sad situation, but have you actually written about the train wreck before? No. No. Well, you should. It's a good one. Put that one in the yeah, next one. I wrote a poem about the, about the New York Central once. Okay. I want, yeah, I wanted to ask you. I kind of skipped over the poetry because I tend to be more of a you know, the journalist yeah. story kind of um, person. But um, your poems, what do, you, what, do you, what, do you, what do you write about poems? Well, the, po the poems? poetry, and I have to tell you, I've written less poetry over the last four or five years, and I've taken, I haven't taken as good care of it, which is another thing about writing. You have to take care of your stuff um, because nobody else will, and you lose things. You know, like I have notebooks filled with all kinds of stories, and, and maybe they're this, I've been trying to write the same story over and over and over, and it's, it's got all these, you know, all of these uh, versions. Um, and other st ideas, you get ideas all the time. I, I still, I'm basically an idea machine, which drives people crazy, especially my wife. But I mean, I, I like, I get ideas from the ideas, and then of course they don't go anywhere. So if you can't have a good conversation about them, they're lost. Mm -hmm. So if you're writing this stuff down, it's the same thing. It's like writing down your ideas, and you may come back, you know, years later and find them. It's like letters. Mm -hmm. I, I was going through letters yesterday, which I don't really want to do. Like, I don't really want to. It's like, you say, well, how much time have you got? Well, I, I don't really want to do this, but you know, I have to. It's almost like... It's like work. Yeah. It's work. I have <laughs> to do this. Uh, and I read a couple, and I was like really blown away by th things people said to me, I don't know, 30 years ago. And then, then you have to ask yourself, well, why did you save this letter in the first place? And a lot of it is just because I just save stuff. Uh, the, no particular reason. It's just there. You know, it's still there. And with poetry, I, I've, um, I was very formal about you know, typing it up and putting in manuscript form. And um, I was going to send it out. I, I had a manuscript of 65 pages or something. I don't know how many. And I got, got it all ready to send out. And I'd published 20 or 30 of them or something. And I just sort of lost interest. 
I started thinking, okay, big deal. I get a book of poetry published, or you know, and um, uh, it'll take five years to get somebody to say they'll publish it. And, and a lot of friends of mine are poets, and I, you know, I know the story about the Poe Biz, you know, and I didn't play that game really well, and I said the hell with it. But I, I'm still a poet, you know, so. Um, the poetry is, is now a lot of it's just, and I write in longhand, so a lot of it's in longhand, and it isn't edited much. Um, I have a collection, though, called The Time We Make in Passing, and I, I think my theme, which runs through a lot of uh, things that I write, is about uh, how, how life goes by and how you're in it uh, at sometimes in extreme sensitivity to everything. And other times, not at all. Mm -hmm. But it's still going by. Uh, and if you don't take note of what's going by as you're doing it, and, and my backdrop is sort of nat the natural world. Like I think the poem, The Time We Make in Passing, is actually about chopping down a tree. And, and, it, and it's something that, that I've done with, a, with an ax, a hand ax. I mean, so every, every swing, you take a little piece out of the tree. I mean, it's so much different than a chainsaw, which I've also used. Um, but an axe really slows down time mm -hmm. and makes you think about what you're doing. With each, with each swing as it yeah. goes down. Yeah. It's also a lot more, a lot more work. <laughs> yeah. It's like exhausting. jogging as opposed to sprinting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, there's this um, mental state you get into and, and time sort of you know, catches up with you where you catch up with it. For, and, and it's not for a long period of time, but it's very, very in sync. And, and, and when you're writing, um, that happens to you sometimes. Not all the time. Mm -hmm. But if you're not writing, it's not going to happen at all. I mean, so the, the whole thing about writing is to sort of find out, well, what, what's going on, you know, that I'm not aware of? Uh, and it makes you aware of what's going on. And it makes you use your head. How, how often do you write? Do you, do you write every day? Do you write? I write a lot. I, I'm a streak writer. Um, so it's hard to say. I think I write in my head all the time. I mean, uh, there's conversations going on in characters and things, and I, I sort of like to work a lot, of, a lot of things out. I didn't, as a poet, I didn't do this, but as a, as a short story writer, I do it a lot. I, I sort of work things out before I, I do a draft in my head. Uh, and then I, I, I try to, f and the other reason I like short stories is I can finish the whole draft, and then I got something that I have to go back to. Before we met today, I was going over a story that um, I had written uh, a couple months ago, and uh, it, the things that didn't jump out at me when I wrote it jumped out at me today. I was like, oh, well, naturally. I, why did I say, why, why does this character say this and then not elaborate? Whereas when I wrote it, it seemed like that's all the character had to say. But now it's like, oh, this is obviously a hole here. I mean, nobody would stop at this point. You know, nobody. And so I, I can't let him do that. And it's about, you know, the story's about a theme I'm really interested in and have been exposed to most of my life, but I, did, I haven't been able to write about it. You know, which is teacher-student relationships. In a real way. Not, I mean, we've done a lot of the, the bizarre stuff, you know. It's like kidnapping, you know. Like, what, uh, and that was one of the first things that I got taught as a kid little kid coming home from school, you know, no getting a car out of you know. That's very, you know, if you're writing about kidnapping or murder or something that's violent, it, your stuff's right there on the surface and everybody jumps. But what about the subtle stuff? The subtleties, yeah. That's a good point. I'm more interested in what's underneath the obvious. Than, and and so, so you have to actually write through a lot of obvious stuff to get to it. And I, I would hope that my life um, has been considerate of that level. And then I would hope sometimes maybe I've lived at that level, but you know, maybe not. Mm -hmm. I'm like everybody else, you know. I, I want it easy, and I want it both ways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does. That does sound like most of us. For yeah, sure, for sure. Yeah. So r writing doesn't allow you to do that. Mm -mm. No, and I think I like the, just the way you talked about the subtleties, just seeing the, the simple things, because for most of us, life isn't extraordinary. You no, know, I, you have it is the it, it is the mundane. It's the, the day in and the day out kind of stuff. And there's there's some beauty in that, and there's some Absolutely. worth to that to telling people what that's what that's like going getting up in the middle of the night and going to deliver somebody's baby for the the fiftieth baby that week. I mean, there's just something there's something 
I think, magical about it. You know, the fact that he wants to keep doing that and he can get up every time and bounce, bounce yeah. up and get ready and things like that. Yeah, just um, yeah, I really liked all that medical stuff in there. I thought that was really, really good through, throughout the book. And I love the time changes too. Like it started in an earlier time, and then with each story, it kind of you know by the end of the book, it seemed like we're more in the present. You know, like each each decade, you know, was uh, was, was represented um, with the story and a. And a Huh. Society, I, I like that. I like that a lot. And I couldn't pinpoint like, oh, this is definitely the '60s, or this is definitely the '70s. But you could see the progression through the through yeah. the book to, to me, um, through time. Like the old, the first one seemed like more old, old like '50s. I got a sense of the '50s, and then I marked different ones like um, a language of the soul seemed more like um, the '70s, and then um, where I am was the '90s. You know, we're not quite not quite present day. I don't know. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe I was reading into it. Um, Language of the Soul is the, the one where the guy loses his daughter. Uh, yes. The car accident. Yeah. Huh. I don't know why. You thought, you thought Se- 70s? 70s. I don't know what it was about it. Because you throw in these little details and I'm like, I didn't grow up around here either. I grew up on Long Island. Um, so different experience, even though it's the same state, but it's a different experience growing yeah. up Long Island and where you grew up. Um, to us, Westchester County was, was upstate. Um, <laughs> So living in Albany and making it's beautiful. Yeah, it is beautiful. God, I love the woods and the yeah, rocks. Very pretty. People don't think of it like that no. at all. No, they think of it as just an extension yeah, of New York City. It's a mall. Yeah, you know, it's suburbia. not at all. Yeah. New York State's an incredible state. Oh, it is. Physically. It's just mm-hmm. I've been all over this country. I don't I, I, Arizona's pretty mm-hmm. Arizona's a knockout, but it's a completely different thing. Mm-hmm. Right, different terrain. And yeah, but we have a lot people. of different terrains, which is really, yeah. really makes it. It's the most diverse state special. around. Yes, it is. It is. And it's huge. It's just, it's huge. So, um, yeah, I'm trying to think of some of the ones, um, the throughway one about the, um, the ruining farms. I mean, you touched on a lot of different themes in the book, too, which I really, um, really, really liked. Um, huh. Oh, the, the middle ground one about the hunters finding the woman's body, and then you connected that to a couple that was suffering their marriage, and I was just like, it was that was great. It was really I really liked them, and they weren't too long. They were like, and you but you packed in a lot of detail and characterization in each of the you know. So I felt like I really got a handle on who all these people are, where they were living, what was going on, and then you know, then then we moved on to another one, and it was completely different. So it was it's fun. I, I I'm a big fan of short stories. Um, I, I really really I like to read them as much as I can. Um, let's see. As I said, the writing from a woman's perspective. Some of the other ones that really. Uh, grabbed at me. Oh, the one I thought was 80s was the uh, the signs one. Um, yeah. The axe and the wood and the father's accident. That was terrible. That was so sad. You know, it was sad. A lot of sadness in the book, but but I, I definitely saw an underlying theme of some of humor. You know, that life has got its ironies and its its comedy, but yeah, there's, there's sadness. Let's, let's, let's face it. <laughs> you gotta take the, yeah, the, good, uh, the good with the bad. And the... Um the very real thing about fathers and sons, which I'm, I've also been interested in uh, as a writer for a long time, uh, in that um, th- there's this relationship, but it, it's so unverbal. Mm. And it's kind of like uh, I, I, I realized that I had, tr- I had been trying to interview, however loosely we use the term interview, uh, my father for years. And uh, I, I always wanted to know what his dad was all about because nobody ever talked about him. His name was Wells. And uh, I was out in, a, in, a, in the Adirondacks. We used to vacation in the Adirondacks every summer and we were in Blue Mountain Lake and I'm in a canoe with my father. And so I asked him this question. I said, so dad, um, you know, what was grandpa like, you know? And I, I don't remember calling him grandpa because he died before I was born. So it's sort of like, I probably said, what was your father mm-hmm. like? More and more impersonal. Yeah. yeah. And he said, well, he said, uh, I can tell you one thing. He said, I never spent a minute in a canoe with him. <laughs> <laughs> That's how my father would answer a complex question. So, I, you know, I, we're out there. At, and then he tried, he actually tried to, to tell me what his father was like, but he, he couldn't. Um, he sort of, uh, he sort of said, well, um, my dad didn't say much. And um, Jordy and I, that was his brother, always called him the old man. And they, they didn't really have a relationship. I mean, I mean a talking one. Although they slept in the same house, they, 
they actually worked together. Uh, you know, they lived in a small town in the Finger Lakes, and they, they still had chickens and an ice house and all that stuff, and they, did, they had to work on the same farm and do all kinds of things. But he, um, he couldn't really tell me much about him, did, except that he didn't talk much. So... <laughs> there wasn't much what to share. Talk, uh, he told what did he look one, like? <laughs> yeah, what did he look... Well, I have pictures of him. He, he doesn't, you know... And, you know, the photographs you have of people in the in the early part of the century and in the, in the latter part of the last century, they're all foggy and mm -hmm. they're posed, you know, they're Serious, like, yeah, yeah. you know, so he's this sort of, I don't know, looks like he could be anything, mm -hmm. salesman of some sort. <laughs> he looks like Willie Loman. Um, but he, uh, uh, so I've had to make up, I, and I'm working on these stories that, about my grandfather. And when my father, was in his 80s, and he, he lived to be 91, and his last five years weren't so hot. Uh, he had dementia, so he would, what was, ha what was happening in his head was he was going back in his life. So I got a lot of stories that I didn't ask for about um, his early life. And some of the, one day he said to my, he said to me, just, just I, I don't remember if we were sitting on a porch or out in a car or whatever, he just said, um, he said, boy, he says, my father, he said, it must have been a hell of a day for my father. He said, on one side of the street, I was born, and on the other side of the street, um, my brother was, was dying. He had, he had two brothers. He had an older brother who died on the day he was born, and then he had um, a younger brother who was two years younger, who died when he was in his 20s mm. of multiple sclerosis. So my dad was like a the lone survivor of this whole family. His father died of a heart attack in the early 40s. His mother lived to be 89, um, but the last two or three years of her life, she was basically, mm -hmm. maybe it was Alzheimer's, but they didn't have any name for it then. It was just like, you know, mm -hmm. she was old and not making any sense. So this story came out about his father um, was on, in his house, on the day my father was born, and he runs across the street with the good news. And when he gets there, his mother, because he lived, the, all the, they all lived across the street from each other. It was the end of this thing. Um, that's how people lived then. Yeah. He gets across the street to get the news from his mother that his oldest son had just died. Yeah. And my father's thinking about this. Now, he never talked about it. You know, a lot of people tell the story over and over and over, and you go, oh, yeah, I heard that story. He, my father never told the story. <laughs> you know, so I'm like, I can't oh, tell God. Him, tell and of course, I didn't have a, I, yeah. I, we were in some situation where I didn't have a notebook. And I, I, I probably was driving or something. He was sitting there in the other seat. And this would happen to me all the time. He, he would, uh, and, he, and he went, just like my grandmother, he went blind in his older age. So he'd be sitting in the seat, and he'd sit, he knew he knew right where he was. He said, uh, "He said, you know, see this house over here? We'd be going 40 miles an hour, and I'd look, and there'd be a house there. And we'd go by, and he'd go, boy, he said, I've spent a tough night in that place. Hey, what, <laughs> when? What? So he'd tell me the story, you know? Or, we'd go, or we would go by another house, and he would say, oh, he says, I don't know if I can even tell that story. You know, be, wow. like one of those. He said, you... He said, I don't, you're a storyteller. He's I don't think I will. Stories, you know, <laughs> he's always, he talks in stories, not riddles. He's just constantly talking in story form. Well, yeah, so. Thank you, Gary. It was wonderful speaking with you. But before we go, I'd like to uh, properly pronounce your last name, um, Gary McClough. And um, we, were, we were having this discussion before we met, and I went ahead and said it the wrong way in the beginning. So um, from one... Um, uh, Kelts to another, I should say. One mick to another, right? One mick to another, I should say it correctly. Um, but uh, it's, been, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Thanks.